Oh, good morning. Good morning and, and welcome to our service on this, the first Sunday of Lent. A uh, special welcome to any visitors who are, who are with us this morning. If you'd like to identify yourself, do you have any visitors here? I see some return visitors from uh, New College Edinburgh in the dim and distant past, where we were students together, to, uh, to Canada and now to Bermuda. Nice to have you here. You've come to enjoy the warm, sunny weather. Good. <laughs> any other visitors with us this morning? Yes. Well, wow. <laughs> lovely, lovely to, lovely to have you here. Any others? Any others? That's all, all our visitors this morning. Well, welcome. Following our worship this morning, we do have a brief celebration of Holy Communion here in the church. For those not coming to Holy Communion, um, coffee and tea will be served, I think, in the Thorburn Hall today rather than outside. So that will be in the hall. And then following the service of uh, Communion, there'll be a, a meeting of the Congregational Board in the, in the West Hall. Other notices, as, as printed here, we have our coffee and cake on Wednesday mornings at, nine, at 9.30. Uh, no Bible study at, at the moment, but we do have our Lenten services. These are organized by the Warwick Alliance of Churches. And this week, it's the Tuesday evening, it's uh, at 7.30, and it's in Warwick Holiness Church where the preacher will be uh, Wendy Crabb from the Salvation Army. It's an opportunity for us to worship together with other congregations in the sort of Warwick, Paget, and uh, Southampton area. So please consider, there'll be one every Tuesday evening uh, for the next five, next five Tuesdays. So this Tuesday, Warwick Holiness Church at the top of Khyber Pass. Uh, other notices, <coughs> we mentioned uh, about the clearing of the Tanglewood site, and in the course of that, there was a great deal of, of uh, old cedar discovered, um, dead but not rotten, but it's ideal for firewood. Uh, and if you're interested, talk to Kirk Kitson over there, uh, and uh, Kirk will let you know what's involved, i.e. the price. <coughs> other, other notices, yes, you will have received, of course, a leaflet for Messy Church, that's this Saturday, 5 to, to 6.30. It's, um, it's on an Easter theme. It's directed mainly towards uh, young families, but not exclusively. Uh, the format of it is sort of arts and crafts around the theme for a time at 5 o'clock, and then a simple shared meal, and then a short time of worship. So if you're interested in seeing what's involved in that, even if you're not going as part of a young family, you'd be made very welcome. So that's this Saturday. Uh, five, five to six thirty. Um, looking further ahead, I'm asked to intimate that on the 13th of March, the 13th, that's the next of our fabulous Friday evenings, uh, and that's going to take the form of a concert. So it'll be the usual format. Um, there'll be a, a, a meal with the main provided, and you're invited to bring along either a, a side or a or a dessert. And then following the meal, a concert which will feature our our organist. Oliver Grant, and the cellist uh, Kate Cayenne, uh, who in fact recently received a, a Grammy Award for her playing. So that's the 13th of March, not to be missed. I'm sorry, we're not going to be here, but we're going to be away at, uh, at, at Presbytery. So 13th of March, uh, 6 o'clock. For the concert, the charges are going to be $15. There'll be further information about that, but please put that, because they're putting that in your diary now. And say I'll be away. We'll be away from on Tuesday to to, to Presbytery. So for the next two Sundays, there will just be the one uh, service of worship at eleven o'clock. That's for the next two Sundays. So let us worship God. Let us sing to His praise, hymn one hundred and sixty. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, hymn one hundred and sixty.
Because Jesus himself has passed through the test of suffering, he is able to help those who are in the midst of their test. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. We come together with your whole church in heaven and on earth, people of different nations, cultures, backgrounds, histories, but united, united in their desire to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all. We gather in this season of Lent, a time of reflection, a time to reflect on your ways, revealed to us in the prophets of old, the saints of the church, but above all, in the life of Christ. For through his life, we glimpse your love and compassion, your care for all. And as we come to reflect on you, your nature, and your very being, we are invited in this season to reflect on our own lives, to reflect on our priorities and values, our hopes and aspirations, and to examine whether they are in accord with your desire and your wishes for us, for too often they diverge. We go our own way, sometimes motivated by selfishness and self-centeredness, failing to grasp and to understand what you offer to us through your Holy Spirit, the ways of truth and of life. And so too we can be insensitive to the needs of others. As we reflect this morning on the testing of Christ in the Judean desert, we reflect on the tests that we ourselves face in our own place and in our own time. And we acknowledge we do not always live up to what you ask of us. And so before you now, we ask your forgiveness, as we ask also the forgiveness and the patience of those whom we have hurt or wronged or let down. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of your forgiveness that we might be freed from these faults and failings and guilt of the past. Help us to discern your presence in our lives today. To put aside in this season of Lent times of quiet and of reflection, to hear your word to each other, one of us and to ourselves as a church. Help us to better understand what you ask of us, to grow closer to you and so closer to one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Right, give the boys and girls down the front, and it's uh, it's first of the month, so it's Spaghetti Sunday. So if anyone's got any pasta that they'd like to uh, they'd like to do, if they haven't had it in yet, just collect the pasta on your on your way forward. <laughs> there we are. Good, good. Great, lovely to, lovely to see you all. Were you listening carefully to the words that we began our service with just before the, just before the prayer? It said for this particular Sunday, because Jesus himself has passed through the test. He passed the test. Do you like tests? Do you, like te do you get tests at school these days? Do you? Do you get tests? What kind of tests do you get? Math tests? H hard tests, are they pretty hard? <laughs> yeah. Literacy, okay, yeah. Science tests, you, but spelling tests, great. So you still get tests at school? I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure. When I was your age at school, which was quite a long time ago, 
the day started, every school day started with an arithmetic test. Okay, every day, mental arithmetic it was called. And what kind of seats do you have it? Do you sit in tables with circ circular tables or do you sit in rows? Or do you sit anywhere you like? And what, what kind of, what's your classroom look like? I haven't been in any of your classrooms. Yeah. Your teacher's always changing it. Wow. Right, keep you, right, keep you in your toes. Right, well, when I was at school, we sat in rows. Okay, the row at the back, the next one, the next one, the next one, and down to the front. Okay, and mental arithmetic started at the back. Right, and you got asked a question. And if you got it wrong, it went to the next person. If they got it wrong, it went to the next person. So someone got it right. And they then moved up and you all had to move down. Right, and it went all the way around the cl I thought we might try that actually. This <laughs> <coughs> shall, shall we do it with the grown ups rather than with, shall we? Right, we'll, we'll, we'll start at the back and see who ends up at the front, shall we? That might be a bit unfair. That might be a bit unfair. But yeah, that was a that 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 was a test that we got that we got at school when I was when I was your age. And if you were off school, if you were off school, if you were sick or something like that, when you went back to school, where do you think you had to sit? Right at the front. Right, you sat at the front, and uh, the plan was if you were good at it, but you tried to work your way further back. Anyway, these were the tests when I was at school. We're going to be looking at a at tests at a test today that, that Jesus was faced with after his baptism. He went off into the desert at a place near Jericho. And when we were there just back in October, we, we visited it and you, Jericho and you look up the hillside to what's called the Mount of Temptations, or really the Mount of Testing. And there's a there's a monastery up there now, up on the top of the cliff. And you don't need to climb up because there's a cable car that takes you up, right? Which wasn't there in Jesus' time, right? And if you don't want to go up to the monastery, instead you can pay five dollars and have a ride in a camel down at the foot, or go to the gift shop. And it wasn't there in Jesus. You go to the gift shop, right? Right. <laughs> Well, the gift shop wasn't there in Jesus' time either, right? The camel might have been, but not the same camel. But uh, no, uh, no cable car and no gift shop. And there he was up in the mountain. And he, was being, he was being tested to find out really what he felt was most important. It was the beginning of his, of his ministry. He'd been baptized. And this was him having to go away for a time just to think about what, what were the things that were most important important to him and he got asked questions right he got asked questions which really made him think well what are the things that are most most important to me and it's some of these answers that we're going to be looking at this morning and I think as you go through the next few weeks at CCY and when we have our messy church service as we come up to Easter we'll again be looking at these things that are most important so we think about that yourselves, the things that you think are most important. And we're fortunate that we don't have to go through the test that he did. We might have tests of spelling, yeah, spelling tests, sums, literacy. We have these tests. And this is a different kind of test. It's a test that asks us, what's important to you? What matters most? We're going to sing now hymn 755. It's a time for quietness. We still and know that I am God. Hymn 755. <laughs>
a blessing on our children. Loving God as our children go from here, may they grow at all times in their lives knowing your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I wish I had half his energy. <laughs> Continue our worship now with our first reading from the Old Testament. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. First reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. You'll find it on page two of the Pew Bible. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in, that, in the day that you eat it, you shall die. The second reading uh, is on the same page. Chapter 3 and verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other world, wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed the fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The, <clears throat> the choir will sing the anthem, Thou knowest, Lord, the secret of our hearts, by Purcell.
The Gospel for today is the Gospel of St. Matthew. St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4 and at verse 1, page 3 in your New Testament. It follows Jesus' baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 4 and at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Sing the Lenten hymn, hymn 337, 40 days and 40 nights thou was fasting in the wild, hymn 337. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The principal passage for today, the first Sunday in Lent, is the gospel passage. The temptation, or perhaps more correctly, the the testing of Jesus in the Judean wilderness. The accompanying Old Testament passage is the passage that we read from the the book of Genesis. 
and has been commented it's a passage that could hardly simply now be read and, and passed on. And the reason for that is perhaps some of the many misunderstandings or consequences of the interpretation or the misinterpretation of the, of the Genesis passage. It's in all probability comes from some of the older traditions uh, of, of scripture. There are different sources in the, in the first five books of the, of the Old Testament. Different sources from different times, but one of the sources goes back probably to around the 10th century. And it's that particular source that this reading was, was taken from uh, today. The story of Adam and Eve and what is traditionally known as, as the fall. Why is it felt there's a need to comment on it? Well, well, for two reasons. One is that the effect that it has had through the centuries and in many different societies on the place of women, who quite simply so often get the blame. And that's despite reading the passage carefully, we tend to remember that it was the serpent, the crafty serpent that invited Eve to taste the, the forbidden fruit and having done so, then involves Adam. And so it's, it's, it's the woman's fault. Of course, if you read the text carefully, what Adam says, and having been discovered, he said, it was the woman that you gave me. The woman that you gave me. So in a sense, in a sense, Adam places his blame back on, back on, on God himself. But it has had the effect, as I say, in many societies and down through the centuries and putting women down, blaming them, um, it's their fault, uh, suppressing them, really oppressing them in the lives of, of many societies and in the lives of many institutions. All of that resting, all of that resting on a misinterpretation of, of the text. And I hope that comes as some reassurance to the ladies in the congregation who maybe still feel at times put down on uh, simply, simply for being simply for being a woman. Because the other thing is that the, the problem, if one tries to, to, to take the text literally, which was never intended even by, by those who, who wrote it, what was their purpose in writing this? It wasn't to suggest that the first two people on earth were, were Adam and Eve, and that a perfect world became imperfect because of their, their failings, their, their disobedience. It was the writers of this tradition struggling struggling with the question as to why life was and is. Why is it when they present creation as being the work of God and of being a good work, why is it that we only need to look around to see brokenness and suffering and hurt and wrongdoing? How can that be, how can that be squared? You know, in other philosophical traditions or in ancient religions, it was squared by simply suggesting that there was, if you like, a pantheon of gods, and there was a good God, and there was a bad God, and creation was the stage on which they fought out their, their, their battles, and we were, in a sense, mere players in the, in the conflict between the two. And in a sense, that, that made some sort of sense. The goodness came from the good God and the the evil, the wrongdoing, the badness came, came from the bad God. That's not part of the tradition of Judaism and Christianity, which affirms that there is but one God who is responsible for the creation of all, of all creation, and that that creation was good. It was a creation with which he was pleased. And yet the writers, and not just the writers of, of Genesis and the book of Job, but Theologians, philosophers down through the centuries and ourselves, ordinary men and women, have struggled with this question. Simply sometimes put, why do bad things happen to good people? Or put otherwise, why is there suffering and brokenness in the beauty of, of God's creation? And so they write this story, which is not an answer to it, no more than the book of Job is an answer to the question of suffering, but they, they write this, this story which really reflects something of, of human nature as being rebellious. Rebellious in that it's created in the image of God, but was not content with that, 
not content to be created simply in the image of God, but wanted to be God-like, himself or herself, to attain equality with God, and so to rebel against God, to know all that God was to know, the, the reason for the existence, if you like, of, of good and of evil. So it is essentially a, a story of, of rebellion. It wasn't, in a way, taken up by, by great St. Paul, and of course Paul used it to suggest that it was that disobedience, if you like, that rebellion that brought death into the world. And yet we know that death has been part of creation since its very earliest moment. Death did not become part of creation through the disobedience of these figures, Adam and Eve. Death has always been part of, of, of creation, death and, uh, and, and life. And Paul took that on and Augustine took that on, the great St. Augustine. And, and bizarrely, if the early church had followed the thinking of Irenaeus, one of the great church fathers, rather than Augustine, it would have moved in a different direction. And Irenaeus posited that really creation was an ongoing evolutionary work. There was no perfect time in the past, but it's just a process of, 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 of evolution. So that's the passage from Genesis and the two reasons why there is a need to reflect on it because of the misunderstandings that so often can come from it and from the hurt and the harm that it has caused women over the, over the centuries. To turn to the passage in Matthew's Gospel, the temptations or perhaps more accurately the, the testing of Jesus in the Judean wilderness. In Matthew's account, it follows immediately on from his baptism. He is taken off into the wilderness, we're told for a period of 40 days and 40 nights. And again, one simply needs to understand the, the symbolism of that. 40 is a, is a favorite figure in, in scripture, the, the days of the flood, 40 days, 40 nights. The wandering in the wilderness of the people of Israel in the Sinai wilderness for 40 years. And, and, and so on. And so the 40 days in the wilderness are sort of paralleling or symbolic of the 40 years of the people of Israel uh, in the Sinai wilderness. And during that time, he's approached and he's, and he's tested. And there's a great deal that one can take out of, of, of this, this marvelous passage. It's often been said that no one should preach on it without reading Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, Dostoevsky is the brothers Karamazov, and the particular chapter or passage in that called The Grand Inquisitor. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's a ma marvelous passage. It's, it's a two-volume book, but it's a marvelous passage, The Grand Inquisitor. And it's about the tension, if you like, between the freedom that Christ was to offer and the power that was held by the church. It's set in the 16th century in Seville at the time of the Inquisition where hundreds were burnt at the stake each day for their heretical views. And in the midst of that, in Dostoevsky's book, the, the poem, which is actually in prose, Christ reappears and he's confronted by the Grand Inquisitor, an old, an old man, perhaps embittered, is it you? The passage begins, is it you? Now don't answer, says the Grand Inquisitor. He knows by whom he is being confronted. And then there follows this almost interrogation of the Grand Inquisitor of, of the returned Christ, with Christ never answering, Christ never answering. And he blames Jesus for quite simply asking too much of people. You ask too much of them. You offered them a freedom which was beyond what they could cope with. You should have just turned the stones into bread. You should have just done what they ask. We have corrected your work, he says, and we will finish it. Right. We have corrected your work and we have finished it. We are giving them what they want. And of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attack, if you like, it's a critique of the, of the Roman Catholic Church at at that time. But that's perhaps a, a key element of it. You ask too much of people. We are not going to ask all that of them. We'll simply give them what they want. And having given them what they want, 
they will come down and bow down before us and they will take you tomorrow and put you on the fire. And so it's an accusation of, of Christ. We have built, they say, the Grand Inquisitor said, we have built on miracle and power. And you simply offered them freedom. So it's, it's, a, it's fascinating and it's a, an interesting passage. And at the end, at the end of the confrontation, this return Christ simply goes and kisses the old man on the lips. And you can see, you can sense it's shaken he is by all that has happened. And then Christ goes out again into the, into the darkness. So that's one way of looking at it. This tension, if you like, between human freedom, which Christ comes to offer us, and the fullness of life that comes from that, or what the Inquisitor was wishing, the, the Inquisition offered, the, the power over people and the, give them simply what, what they want and they'll, be, and they'll be happy. Another way of looking at the temptations is this. When we think of the temptations or the testing, where do we place ourselves? Do we put ourselves in, in Christ's place and reflect on our own temptations or our, our own times of, of testing? and reflect on how we would respond or, or have responded. Let's for a moment put ourselves in the other place of asking the questions. If you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. In the conversation that follows, or the conflict that follows, both Jesus and the devil, if you like, they're both quoting from Scripture. They both know it. They're both quoting from it. They're both quoting from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy. The devil says one thing and Jesus comes back and says, no, no, man, God says we shall not live by bread alone. Let's throw yourself off the parapets and you'll be rested by the angels. No, no, says Jesus. Scripture says, do not put the Lord your God to the, to the test. And then, of course, finally, if you just bow down to worship me, I will give you power over all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus said, get out of here. What is it that the devil had put ourselves in his place? What are we asking? What is he asking? If you are the son of God, why don't you do these things? Do we not do that? Do we not do that with God? If you are all loving and all powerful, and are watching over us. Why don't you do this? So and so is seriously ill. Why don't you make them better? There's a terrible disaster in the part of the world. Why don't you fix it? What, what do we expect of God? And we probably expect the same thing as the, as the devil in this confrontation. If you are the son of God, then get it fixed. Sort it. And yet Jesus' response is to show us a different side, a different nature of, of God's being. That is not the manner of his presence in the world as it was not the manner of, of Jesus' presence in the world. He was not going to turn the stones into bread. He was not going to throw himself off the parapet of the temple. And most crucially, he was not going to be taking on the power over all the nations and splendor of the world. And we probably still think, well, why not? Would it not have been better? Would you not then have given us the things, perhaps, that we want? And we're back to Dostoevsky and the Grand Inquisitor. Just give us the things we want. Instead, we're perhaps given the things that we, that we need. And so the, the testing on the Mount of, the Mount of Temptations and Jesus' response which, above everything, at the beginning of his ministry, sets out the direction of it, the priorities and the, and the values of it, and shows how he will live out his time on this earth, demonstrating to us not a sort of awesome and frightening power of, of God to, to fix things that we would like them fixed, but to be present amongst us in a caring and a compassionate and a humble and yet a loving way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
in a sense, reflecting that theme, hymn 393 is the poem written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor and theologian who was arrested and imprisoned by the Nazis and at the, near the end of the war in Flossenburg concentration camp was, was executed. His poem, or part of his poem from letters and papers that he wrote from prison. In 393, we turn to God when we are sorely pressed. 393. <laughs> Sadly, in, in recent weeks, it seems that almost every Sunday I've had to announce the passing of one of our members, and again today, I'd announced that last Sunday saw the death of Ian Brown. Ian's memorial service will be on my return from, uh, from, from Presbytery, so that memorial service won't be until Thursday, March the 19th. So Thursday, March the 19th for Ian's service, and just to take this opportunity that the following day, Friday the 20th will be a memorial service for, for Tom Smith, uh, whose daughter Fiona will have returned from Australia at that time. But say last Sunday, Ian quietly passed away, and so we remember his daughter Linda and his friends in our prayers this morning. Let us pray. Almighty God, for all your gifts and blessings to us in our lives, for all that enriches and enhances our lives, we give you thanks for the opportunities before us each day and for all that contributes here to our standard of living. We thank you too for the love by which we are enriched each day, the love of families, the support of friends in our daily life and work, and the fellowship and communion of your church. And in this season of Lent, we give thanks for the opportunity, for the moments of quietness and reflection, to ponder again the mystery of your ways in our midst, a spirit that hovered over the very beginning of creation, and that same spirit which seeks to inspire and prompt and challenge us now, and in our times of need, come simply to heal to comfort and to console. And we give thanks for the life and for the example of Christ. As we reflect on his time of testing, his awareness 
of what would reveal your nature and your ways. His obedience, his refusal of rebellion, so much part of our own human nature. In his name now we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and friends, wherever they may be at this time, and ask for your blessing upon them. We pray for those whom we know personally, by name, and whom we know to be in a special need at this time. For other those who are ill at home or in hospital, those recovering from treatment or surgery, and those sadly whose illness or condition knows no cure. For them and for their families we ask the blessing of your peace. We pray for those who are lonely, those surrounded by others, for any who are anxious, for whom the night is long, the hours pass slowly in their anxiety and concern. For those who have been bereaved and for whom this is a time of loss and adjustment to the absence that overwhelms their lives, may they too know the comforting healing of your Holy Spirit. We pray to you this day for any who have been abused, whatever the nature of that abuse. Women in violent relationships. People abused because of their faith. Those who are abused by their own people, their own governments, oppressed. We pray for all who are victims of abuse. We pray for a greater peace and respect and understanding of our natures, of our differences. We pray for the many millions who find themselves stateless at this time, forced by war and by violence to leave their homes, their villages and their towns. As we look with sadness on the horror of war and violence which so scars the beauty of your creation, this our world. And we pray for all who are engaged in the work of peacemaking. Those men and women of armed forces charged with trying to keep the peace, those diplomats and politicians seeking to find a new and a better peace within communities and between nations. And ordinary men and women like ourselves who in their own communities seek to overcome the divisions and the barriers that keep us apart. We pray too for those who struggle today will be with poverty and hunger in a world of rich resources. And we pray for those who wield power in this your world. The leaders of the nations and others with influence and power over all our lives. May they be men and women of integrity, honesty and compassion. May they be inspired by the vision of your kingdom with its priorities and values. And may their use of power never be an abuse of it, but used in the service, the humble service of those whom they represent. And we pray for your church in this season of Lent, that we may reflect better on your ways and what it is you ask of us, the life of this congregation, for your church on the island, for your church in the world, placed here to show how we might better live one with another. And always with thanksgiving we remember those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. May we never think them far from us, for we share a fellowship and a communion with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The offering will be received.
Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this our offering and all our offerings of time, of talents, and of money, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and for the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Our closing hymn is hymn 517, which is not in fact, lift up your hearts, we lift them Lord to thee, but is that well-known wedding hymn, fight the good fight. <laughs> so hymn 517, fight the good fight with all your might. Now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love, this day and always. Amen.